This week's episode is brought to you by Fairy Godmother Travel. Contact them for all your Disney-related travel needs. Send them an email at CaminoCoreWeekly at FairyGodmotherTravel.com and tell them we sent you. Hello, and welcome to CommuniCore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And I'm totally obsessed with going on Periscope lately, George. Yeah, I know. It's weird. I'm always on the Periscope. It's like this weird voyeuristic thing. You want people to watch you. Yeah, but it's it's watch it's, me it's like do random voyeurism. stuff like eat macaroni. Yeah. Or wash wait for the me. dishes. You know, it's you've done that several times. I have, just and people George watch. It's really weird. Yeah, yeah. What's fun is though when I get online and put the phone near the mic when we're on Skype, and there's that four second delay. It really yeah, just it's really with bizarre you. for me. And but they <laughs> people seem to enjoy it. They really seem to enjoy it. But we we I mean I will I usually periscope when I'm in the park. So that's a good reason to follow me if you listen to yeah, the show. You can definitely you can see live stuff from the parks, and we can interact and have a good time together. While I'm, we can take I can take you on rides. Ooh. Even you, George. Ooh. I well, see, but sometimes I'm like asleep when you're at Disneyland, though. That's true. That's true, because there is yeah. a time difference, and yeah. you're also yeah. older than me, so you go to sleep a little oh, bit God. later. Yeah, and all that's, yeah, it's just a mess. Yeah. It's still a big mess. That's okay. Wait till I see a Dragon Con. That's true. That's so. true. That's true. You're going to punch <laughs> me right in the guts. Anyway, <laughs> before I get hurt anymore, let's go to the history segment. It's time for Disney History. When we talk about dark rides, most cadets probably think of, you know, the Haunted Mansion, or Pirates of the Caribbean, or something like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. And depending on who you talk to, the definition of a dark ride can vary quite a bit. It's not quite like the argument over theme park versus amusement park, but it's still hard to pinpoint the exact beginning of the dark ride, unless you go with a specific school of thought. You know, and as far as we're concerned, here at CommuniCore Weekly Headquarters, because we have to have two headquarters. We do. We have dual headquarters. Yes, co-headquarters. That's it. So uh, the dark ride can trace its roots to the 19th century with the uh, addition of Old Mill or Tunnel of Love rides. You could also argue that some of the first dark rides are even the older scenic railways. Another school of thought is that the dark ride is in, was invented in 1928 by Leon Cassidy. Now, let's board our swan boat time machines and learn more about the dark rides. Are we in them? Do we go back? I don't know. I was waiting. Oh, okay. I'm going to assume. Are you going to do the music or something? <laughs> we're on Wayne's World. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> so now that we're back in time here, you know, just like George mentioned, the old mill rides and scenic railways could be considered the descendants of the dark ride. In the latter part of the 19th century, you know, we started to see old mills and Tunnel of Loves, you know, they, they started popping up alongside gravity railroads. And there isn't an exact date for when old mill rides started to become popular, but in 1886, Lamarcus Thompson patented a design for a coaster he built at Coney Island that had dark tunnels with painted scenery. And scenic railway, railways would become extremely popular in the next few decades at amusement parks across the United States. Okay, so a scenic railway was a gravity coaster. It's one in which the riders would ascend to a high platform and it held a car with benches. They would then ride down a series of hills or bumps. Then the cars would repeat the journey in the opposite direction. Uh, Thompson faced very stiff competition after the debut of his first switchback railroad, as they were called. And instead of creating higher and faster drops, he decided to add tunnels with lights and scenery, which were usually painted flats or, you know, like fake rock formations. The Great Depression would uh, actually spell the end of the golden age of, of coasters, and there wouldn't be a revival until 1972. But more about that in a future episode. And if you're from the future, I hope you enjoyed that one. 
<laughs> now, the old mill rides in the Tunnels of Love, they were fairly popular during the same time, and they evolved in a very similar fashion. Um, some of the earliest incarnations were just two-person boats that floated through dark tunnels or passages, and sometimes they were called river caves due to the very obvious theme. <laughs> so, speaking of themes, the Tunnel of Love rides would often be themed in one of two ways. Either a mm, darker and romantic, or usually just dark, you know, a ride that allowed the couple to cuddle, or a spooky version that I would never ride that would offer an opportunity for the couple to hold on to each other during, well, that's a good reason to ride a scary ride. Right? Right? Yeah, okay, so, so the couples would then hold on to each other during the ride. And the popularity of these rides were pretty high during the late 19th century, due more to the social stigmas about unmarried couples not having any physical contact in public. The river cave rides would have, you know, more theming, including some animatronic-like figures that would tell the stories of myths and legends or display scenes of other cultures around the world. So, these figures would be known as stunts in the amusement industry. And they had lots of styrofoam uh, staglomites and stacolites. I always say them wrong, but you know, the things hanging from the ceiling of caves and on the bottom of cave uh, yes. floors, those things. Um, but most of these, they, you know, they lost popularity in the 1950s as thrill rides kind of came into vogue. So the old mill style rides were originally made out of wood, which would then spring leaks over time. You know, wood and water don't really mix very well. And they became very expensive operations for a park to maintain, and it leads us to the next type of dark ride, which is usually what most amusement park enthusiasts think of. And it sort of started with the pretzel. So sort of switching my Disney metaphors, Dr. Grant Seeker, can you punch in Bridgeton, New Jersey, 1928? What, what, was that a pterodactyl? <laughs> and an Animal Kingdom reference? I know, I know, I know. Uh, five points to House Taylor. <laughs> anyway, so Leon Cassidy was looking for a cheaper alternative to the more expensive water-based rides, and with his partner, Marvin Remfer, they hit on an idea. So Leon and Marvin took over the Tumbling Dam Park, which was a trolley park, and they added a merry-go-round, scooters, and a water slide. And they wanted to add an old mill ride, but the cost was prohibitive for the smaller park. So they started playing around with a Dodgem car, which is what they called bumper cars back in the day, and eventually, they had a dry version in which the Dodgem car followed a single electrical track. The ride debuted as the Firefly, but it wasn't a very popular term or name, seeing as how many amusement parks were quite flammable, if you also, remember our episode of uh, on Coney Island. I was just going to say, it, it also wasn't popular amongst Fox uh, executives, so they canceled it oh, shortly I afterward. Ooh, I, I need to go watch it right now. <laughs> so anyway, okay, now that's, I guess I'm going to watch that tonight, so okay. So, can't go with Firefly, not a good choice. So the name was changed to The Pretzel after a patron remarked that he felt like he'd been bent into a pretzel after riding. An industry was born when Cassidy and Rumpfer started the Pretzel Amusement Ride Company, very original name, guys, and began building pretzel rides for other amusement parks and fairs. The cars were designed to resemble the Model A Fords and had a 40-pound iron pretzel on the front to keep the cars from jumping the track. Was it salted or unsalted? Well, it depends, I guess, on how fast it went. Oh, okay. Fair the enough. more salt would add more weight. I figured. I figured. Okay. So, so, yeah. so the pretzel ride that was produced uh, beginning in 1929 would have five cars, 350 feet of track, and offered a one and a half minute ride. The cost was $1,200, which in today's terms is about $17,000. So as the popularity grew, they offered different versions, including double-decker rides and including a chain lift. Um, they also offered uh, different themes as well, included the Haunted House, uh, the Gold Nugget, Spookorama, Pirate's Den, Arabian Nights, Winter Wonderland, Orient Express, and one called A Laugh in the Dark with spinning cars. So one of the innovations, uh, the next innovations for the pretzel, or the Laugh in the Dark type rides, was the addition of a hinged bar system that the car would then ride over. This would activate a stunt. Uh, it's like something that would pop out of a barrel or from behind a flat, you know, design. The stunts would gain popularity since they were easily added to existing Laugh in the Dark rides. Eventually, we would see skeletons, spear-wielding savages, and anything else that matched the theme of the ride. Animated Display Creators was a company known for making lifelike displays for stores. They would begin creating more ghoulish stunts. 
So Dark Rides would continue with more pirates and jungle themes in the late 1960s and 70s, but the biggest change would be with the debut of Disneyland in 1955. You know, Peter Pan's Flight, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, uh, and Snow White's Scary Adventures, you know, they added a more theatrical sense and scenes to the classic Dark Ride formula. And there was also a level of quality with the artistry that hadn't been seen before. And of course, the opening of Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion basically signaled a brand new direction for the entire industry. So pirates really took advantage a lot of a lot of the pirate-themed dark rides that had come before, of course, uh, you know, with the addition of Mark Davis's brilliant character sketches to add another dimension. Pirates is still thought of, though, as the evolution of the earlier Old Mill and River uh, cave rides. Not many attractions today, though, can duplicate the scope and artistry of Pirates of the Caribbean. The Haunted Mansion really is a direct descendant of the Laugh in the Dark rides, but again, on a scale that only a, you know, a Hollywood company can recreate. The final graveyard scene actually offers the pop-up ghosts rather than the simple animatronic displays that harken back to the 40s and 50s. And of course, the mansion as a whole, with its, you know, elaborate Pepper's ghost and special effects, you know, is still a masterpiece that has never quite been surpassed yet. So when, when you talk about dark rides, most people think of Mr. Toad's uh, wild, wild Ride or a Laugh in the Dark type haunted house. But really, almost any ride that's enclosed in a building can be considered a dark ride. It's a small world. Spaceship Earth, The Seas with Nemo and Friends, Test Track, and even the amazing and incredible Grand Fiesta Tour are all dark rides. But you can also have dark coasters like Space Mountain, Rock and Roller Coaster, Flight of Spe uh, Fear, and Mystery Mine. Toy Story Mania and the Ghost Blasters type attractions that you see at Knott's Camp Snoopy are examples of interactive dark rides. Now, dark rides at theme and amusement parks have evolved over the past 100 years to include, you know, some of the most groundbreaking and iconic rides. And, you know, there's still a handful of older Laugh in the Dark and Pretzel rides still out there, uh, so you can still experience them today, including the Spookorama at uh, Dino's Wonder Wheel Park in Coney Island. And actually, I think there's a few on uh, Santa Monica Pier as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's exciting. So there's got to be one near you. There's got, there has to be. There absolutely there has, has to be. To be. <laughs> Especially with a lot of fairs and amusements or, you know, traveling fairs or state fairs. Um, the, o well. the Orange County Fair, actually, which takes place right by my house and is starting very soon, they actually have like two or three dark rides. I, I know they're super old, too. Mm, so that might be kind of cool to see. But we would love to know what you guys think uh, about dark rides. What do you think is the original dark ride? Or do you have a favorite dark ride? Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. He's a nerd. He's a, nerd. He's a geek. He's a geek. Cause we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ha! It's George's Book of the Week. Okay, so I've got three books this week. And no, this is not going to be a 72-minute segment, Jeff, so don't worry. Um, three books, all from the Disney Pixar film Inside Out. Because So, yeah, the books just sort of, sort of showed up at my house. So I was like, oh, i got to review them. And they are kind of all for kids, which is okay, though, which is okay. So the first for George reading level. Because <laughs> I can read them quick and look at the photos. <laughs> I like them. Okay, so the first book is a picture book. It's called Inside Out, Sadly Ever After by Elise Allen, illustrated by Daniel Holland. Sadly Ever After is a picture book, meaning that it's geared towards kids around the first grade that are starting to read books on their own, as well as for parents and caregivers that are starting to read to their younger kids. Uh, sadly Ever After, I feel funny saying that, and you're like, oh, well, sadly. Sadly Ever After is a gorgeous book, which uh, it should be since Holland, the illustrator, was the set art director for the film. So it really has that feel of the movie. Um, Sadly Ever After is the story of the emotions from the film with a focus on sadness. And the other emotions really want sadness to feel something other than, well, sadness. Um, they recall some of their favorite memories of Riley. And with each memory, the different emotions give their spin on the memory to show how they each saw it differently. Each one starts out with a happy memory from joy and then each of the feelings describes how it really happened to them so sadly ever after is a very charming book and it coincides very well with the movie and it's a great title for a, a youngling that might have some apprehension after seeing the film or for creating some dialogue with a child that's struggling with emotions or with dealing with their own emotions the next book is called inside out 
the read along storybook and CD. This one again is geared to six year, six to eight year olds or 68 year olds, that's fine. And is basically a retelling of the story with a CD included. And kids, uh, CDs are flat, shiny discs that are sort of like iTunes. So that you can carry it's around. It's a Frisbee. It's a Frisbee that you can listen to. Exactly. How, how do you listen to the Frisbee? You just put it, It's like a, a, sh a shell you put next to your ear and you just... Yes, you have to cram it into your iPhone. No, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, please don't do that. <laughs> okay, so so kids that love the movie and want more of it are really going to like this one, uh, especially if they can listen to the CD while they're reading the book. It's, it's pretty straightforward, follows the story, but, you know, the artwork was created just for this book, so it doesn't quite look the same. Uh, most kids, of course, though, they're not going to care that's slightly different. The CD does have 14 minutes of audio on it. It includes sounds from the movie, including the actual voice cast. So we can get sadness saying stuff for our ringtones. Um, and I really don't want to mention this for the parents out there, but this is a CD that you could listen to in the car if the kids wanted to hear it over and over and over again. Okay. Way to give them ideas. Exactly, I didn't want to. So the last book is called Driven by Emotions, and it's a junior novelization of the film Inside Out. And it's written for 8 to 12-year-olds. And like Sadly After Ever After, the book we first talked about, takes a look at the story from the five different emotions. And the novel is bookended by joy and sadness. Uh, so, you know, they, their versions of the different story taking up most of the space. You know, makes sense since joy and sadness are there for the whole film, basically. You know, it, it's interesting, I thought, to read the story from the points of view of disgust and fear and anger. And although it was the same story repeated five times, seeing it from the different perspectives, you know, it sort of shows how different people see things different ways, except for me and Jeff. Yeah, we always see things the same exact always way. Always the same way. All for Human Core Weekly. Exactly. Um, so, driven by emotions, you know, it did get fairly repetitive since it was the same story told five different times. But there were a few other scenes in the book that weren't in the film that they go over. And I think, you know, any tweens that, you know, love the movie are still going to enjoy the book. And it's a good way to think about the film and all the ideas that were presented about feelings and relationships, especially for a child that might be dealing with, you know, sadness or fear. You know, they can see that they're not alone and that no matter what, their friends and loved ones like Jeff and George, want to be with them regardless of their feelings. Well, unless they hate Communicore Weekly, then we don't. We but make that's not possible, possible, right? That's true. It's not possible. Scientifically proven, it's not possible. That's true. Uh, none out of 10 scientists agree that that 10 scientists is wrong and everybody exactly. loves Communicore Weekly. You know it. So, okay, so these this week's three books were Sadly Ever After, Inside Out, The Read Along Storybook, and Driven by Emotions. Sometimes it's a one, sometimes it's a two. When you gotta go, what you gonna do? It's a bathroom break. A bathroom break. You guys, we have gotten a lot of emails from people about flushing on your own terms ever since we initially started talking about it. <laughs> and it's really awesome, I think. Yes. yes. Really cool. We're getting on that t shirt, I promise. It's gonna come eventually. But uh, recently, we got an email from Cadet Kenneth C., who sent along a lovely photo from the Polynesian Resort's main lobby restroom. And what do we see in this, in this photo? Well, we see fantastic rock work on the floors and the walls. We see very flattering lighting, uh, two rolls of toilet paper to choose from, you know, these great open spaces in the stall, and most importantly, a manual flush toilet. That's, that's right. Long wow. live the manual flush. Uh, you know, you guys can continue flushing on your own terms. You just have to go to very specific restrooms, and we're okay with that. The Communicor Weekly guide, field guide to flushing on your own terms. Coming soon? Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe. Okay. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. Let's travel back to everyone's favorite full day park, Disney's Animal Kingdom. <laughs> and after such a long journey, we're gonna take a rest on a lovely bench located in Harambi, in the African section of the park. Now, this bench that I'm speaking of is located near the Harambi Theater, and it's, it's a very nice cement bench, and it's a great way to kick back and relax for a few minutes. But most guests don't even realize they're sitting on a bit of Harambi history, if you will. Written on the bench, in these big, bold letters, it says, Yuhuru, 1961. Now, Yuhuru is the Swahili word for freedom. 
So this bench is actually letting people know that the fictional town of Harambi obtained their freedom in the year 1961. Boom. Hmm. Swahili lesson for the week, ladies and gentlemen. I thought that was like a Star Trek reference. Well, she's, she's also, yes, the female from Star Trek. But if you actually watch Braveheart in Swahili, my favorite part is where Mel Gibson yells, you know, Yahoo! You have the Swahili edition? Who doesn't? You okay. don't have that? Um, so speaking who probably doesn't have it is this week's winner <laughs> for the year <laughs> nice of segment. a million or so limited time cadets. Yay! Hooray! Now, this week's pri- uh, prize is a Disneyland prize pack from Fairy Godmother Travel. Because, as you all know, July is the anniversary month of Disneyland. The 60th anniversary. The diamond anniversary. Excuse me. And this week's winner is Scott D. from South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Congratulations, Scott. Guys, yes. And hopefully you will, you know, take a photo and send it to us so we can post it on the Facebook so the Twitters or Jeff will periscope you. Exactly. Or something like and that. And then be jealous of the prize that you got. <laughs> yeah, probably very jealous. And, and if you want to get in on this action of getting a weekly prize, all you got to do is email communicorweekly at gmail.com with your name, your address, of course, we can mail it out to you, and your birthday, at least the month and the day, so that we can send you a pretty cool birthday surprise as well Heck so yes. just email communicorweekly at gmail.com and get the prize on get, get, is that a new catchphrase get the prize get your on pri- get I'm the not prize sure on. that works and eh, probably doesn't work Fine. we could Man. do treat yourself treat yourself is already taken but we'll steal uh, it we'll steal it anyway so okay wow okay guys well thank you so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Please, if you get a chance, give us a rating and a review on iTunes or leave a comment wherever you watch or listen to the show. We want to hear from you. Yeah, we love those nine stars. Uh, Again, email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com not only to enter the contest, but to say, hey, sup, Corey? Sup, Corey. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicoreweekly. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and now Periscope. I'm Adam Aginerdy, he's at Jeff Heimbach, and of course, you can always leave us a voicemail on the CommuniCore Weekly Hotline at 424-785-4628. And you can get some really cool CommuniCore Weekly t-shirts by visiting communicoreweekly.spreadshirt.com. And of course, if you want your cadet membership card or some stickers or something like that, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to CommuniCore Weekly, P.O. Box 432, Orange, California, 92856. And if you're looking for another way to support CommuniCore Weekly and making everyone's dreams come true, then head over to patreon.com slash Weekly and see how you can help. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on CommuniCore Weekly, the greatest online show. See a what? <laughs>